sense to you than maybe somebody else. It doesn't mean someone is less of a YouTuber. Maybe right off the bat, I'm speaking your language here, but sometimes like you just you just get what people are saying and it makes sense to you. So I'm a big fan of watching the same title, essentially the same title of a YouTube video or a tutorial like five times, I'm just really yeah. burning it into my brain. Uh, but yeah, this Osmo 3 is pretty cool to start, not going to lie. Um, not sponsored by DJI at all, actually. Um, kind of <laughs> had pains in the past with them with drone issues and stuff. But so far, it looks like they've hit the mark with this. And like as soon as I bought it, I texted Aaron. I was like, check this out. Look what I just got. <laughs> right. Which is a rare it's a rare purchase for you. Like I don't buy a lot of gear. You don't buy a ton. I don't so buy a ton of gear. Whenever and, you do, I immediately drop everything. And I'm like, what? Yeah. Well, I take it upon myself. How can I... I'm just like so into barter, or like bartering. How can I cleverly figure out how to get something for free with my brain and with some elbow grease and some work? And then when I, you know, you pay full price for something, you're like, huh? I mean, yeah, my bank account's a little lower, but that was pretty easy. And now I don't have that to do any easier. deliverables. <laughs> <laughs> it's so much easier. Yeah, it's so much easier. Just yeah, yeah, just pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's funny. <laughs> right? Yeah. Anyways. Yeah. No, I'm with you on that though. I don't I like rarely buy gear. Um I know so many people are gearheads and stuff, but I'm like, I mean, what I have works and no client I, has ever said my quality's not good, so like what's the point? <laughs> so it's like, whoa, you're only shooting with the A73? No, no, no. Get off my site. <laughs> <laughs> no, I got the S3, so so we're good. Oh, cool. How do you like that? I love it. I shoot everything on it. Um, on occasion, clients will need like a red, um, but that's very rare. So yeah, every once in a while I'll, I'll rent that. But for the most part, it just, it takes care of the job. So, um, and awesome. I love S log too. I'm shooting on S log and it looks great. So yeah, yeah, it's key. Cool. Yeah. For you. Are you guys mostly photo only or no, we're doing video right now. Well, yeah. yes. Yeah, get with the times nash this is a video <laughs> world it's, it's video funny world. we brought it up a ton on our show uh like it, it used to be always you know you see an awesome shot and okay i'm gonna get a great photo and ah video is too hard i'm not even gonna bother the moment's so fleeting especially because we do wildlife so yeah. you know i got a photo great i'm happy with it this moment may never ever happen again but we're always trying to push the limits, I guess, right? If What are we doing here if we're not trying to improve, right? So me personally, I'm always thinking photo first now, right? So, I mean, uh, video, video first, first now. Yeah. So, yeah. and if I can get a great sequence, then I'll flip over to photo mode and capture some stills just because there's still a medium for that. It tells a different kind of story, right? And we all need covers for reels. Um, not that that's the main <laughs> attraction for photos, but... It's, yeah. it's still, you know, print still exists, still, still tell a certain story. And, um, I don't think that kind of medium is going anywhere, but video is just so much fun and you can tell so many more different kinds of stories, I think, because you add that fourth element of motion, right? Absolutely. Oh, sure. and, and music, sound, everything. Yeah, it's like, just so I mean, much fun. It's incredibly emotional. So you can really like key it into exactly what you're trying to portray. Mm -hmm. you know? It's just more so. engaging in general. Yeah, it takes way longer. <laughs> it yes. takes way longer to plan out and shoot and edit and uh, just the edit editing choices. Like it's it's yeah. endless. But uh, sometimes I miss just editing a photo for twenty minutes and being like, yeah, <laughs> that was good. Let's post that up there. Boom, yep. done. Yeah, Back but in uh, no, we, we both get into it. Um, but this isn't about us. Let's talk about you. Uh, first of all, thanks for being on the show, Nash. Yeah, um, he's you're all the way in Hawaii. <laughs> yep. <laughs> surfboard behind him too. Yeah. Yeah. Got the Hawaii theme. Got a surfboard, the palm tree, the whole thing. Yeah, as, as got winter. A palm tree. Well, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's not real. I feel like yours is real. Just full disclosure. <laughs> I knew my audience, yeah. I guess. It's not a total <laughs> accident. There you go. For sure. Yeah. I need a palm tree. I'm I'm palm tree less. So oh, you are. What can Maybe you after this episode you'll have to get one. I, I'm gonna search on Amazon immediately. Immediately. Or the fake tree dot com. <laughs> whatever it may be. <laughs> Uh, anyway, you're in Hawaii. Uh, half the audience is pissed off now as winter sets in over here. Um, <laughs> but you mentioned earlier it's raining there. So ha, huh, jokes on you. <laughs> right exactly yeah one of yeah. the few days that are, has rained all day yeah so, yeah well 
but yes. No, that's what you get. That's what you get for <laughs> rubbing it in. Uh, well, welcome to the show. We're gonna we're gonna go through your story. We're gonna go through yeah. you know what got you here. And uh, I discovered, I guess, the origin of this meeting is I discovered uh, one of your reels, and it really just struck me. Um, something that we've talked about in the past. Um, how no, in terms of a pitch uh, to a client, is is nothing but sort of a data point and a, a learning opportunity to figure out, all right, uh, it's a no because why? It's not a failure. It doesn't mean pack it up. It doesn't mean go away. It means let me just try to figure out what I need to do and I'm going to do this a hundred more times. And if I get a hundred no's, it's still, it's still a win uh, in the sense that I've learned a hundred times over what works at all, what doesn't work, what completely doesn't work where i need to change and that really struck me uh as something seth and i really talk about so i knew right away you kind of got that mindset of like let's go get it um and we like that and i i think uh our audience and and people out there um there might be a little bit of trepidation with like going after a client or like nah, they probably have their own marketing team or they probably have a million photographers they work with or i've seen a million photos better than me on this one day like go scrolling through instagram so why would they pick me um we want to impart that sort of like why not like give it a go um and i think part of that reel was like if they say no you're in the same spot you were if you didn't even ask so uh so yeah Tell us about uh, your journey, uh, where you are, where you've been, how you got here, and we'll just go from there. Perfect. Absolutely. I'd love to. Um, so first of all, I've been into the creative space or just interested in telling stories forever. Um, basically, I started filming videos on my parents' dad cam when I was eight years old. I uh, would recruit my siblings to, to be a part of it. Um, they weren't always that excited because I was bossy a lot of times. Um, but, you know, we've made these little skits and videos. Uh, and then during high school, I did a video production class and got into that um, and just started to have more fun with it and realized that people are actually making a career doing this. Like it wasn't just a fun hobby. It's like something I could actually make a living at, which was cool. Um, but I had no idea how, right? So um, I was like, maybe the only option for me is to go to film school because at the time I wanted to be like a DP. I wanted to work on movies, all that kind of stuff. So I went to film school and in film school, they teach you all kinds of stuff, like how to light things, how to frame, how to tell stories, how to write scripts, all that kind of stuff, um, which is great. But I think the part that film school fails is what we're talking about, the business side of things. Uh, Cause like you can know, you can be the best photographer in the world, but if you don't know how to pitch yourself, or if you don't have the correct expectations going into a pitch, then it, it in a lot of ways, it doesn't matter, right? Um, so that's kind of a way that film school failed me in a lot of ways, um, but I didn't know it until later on in my career, right? So uh, after film school, I ended up working on a series of different uh, movies, TV shows, all that kind of stuff. I ended up moving to Hawaii, actually, because I was working on Hawaii Five-0, because um, at the time I was still running. Uh, I did Sick. Jurassic World, wow. uh, which Sick. was dope. Cool. <laughs> you see but my I face? Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I, yeah. Yeah. Your autograph. yeah, dude, we were like blowing up helicopters and like crazy stuff like that. It was so much fun. But Sick. I was a PA, like kind of just mm -hmm. watching it. So I got like the front row view, but I was just telling the homeless people like not to walk in the way of the, the scene, you know? So uh, I saw the DP, I saw what they were doing, but I wasn't like actually on the set. So after doing that for a while, a um, few months, I guess, I realized like the the only path through the film industry is it's kind of militaristic in the way that you have to work your way up, right? So you go from being a PA to being like a camera PA to a second AC, first AC, and then eventually maybe a camera op. And then, you know, if you're lucky, you get to be a DP unless you kind of just try to get your own gigs, right? So that's the other option. So that's what I started to do. I was like, well, maybe I'll just try to get my, my own jobs. Well, like I said, film school doesn't teach you how to do that. So I was basically finding eBooks on the internet. I was looking at YouTube videos and kind of just copy and pasting a lot of scripts that I would find on blogs or whatever. And of course, most of the time they don't work because they're super generic and they don't speak to specific pain points or anything like that. Um, so yeah, I ended up sending over a hundred like DMs or emails and getting like zero responses or just people saying we're not interested. Um, so, you know, that's, that's super discouraging when you get to that level and you're like, well, you know, so many people talk about the hustle culture, like just send, send more, do more work, whatever. But it's like, 
if if we're doing more of the thing that's not working, then it, it just it, like what's the point, right? So mm-hmm. at that point, I had to figure out well, maybe what I'm sending is is not working because it's, it's not talking about the right thing, which sent me on this whole journey of figuring out how to correctly speak to companies, how to find um, the, the right person to talk to, what they're actually interested in, how to frame it the right way. Um, and then over time, I mean, fast forward and, and we can get into the story and everything. But um, today, I mean, I've worked with Four Seasons, Marriott, Royal Caribbean, MSC, uh, like basically the vast majority of the travel brands I probably worked with. Um, and it's because I realized these specific things um, that I'm sure we'll get into in terms of how to how to actually pitch clients. So, yeah. That's awesome. And that's, a, I mean, you're the second, I can't think of, maybe Seth can, there was another guest on that talked about film school and it just does not mm-hmm. teach the business side oh, who was of, that? Right. yeah. It, it, I mean, it's, it's just a common theme that we've heard and it makes sense. Like we're going to, we're yeah. going to teach you the art and the craft, but there's, there's no, you really need a minor in business as you're doing it uh, or something to, to figure out that side of it. Because f- to be good at photography or videography, like I think Seth and I talked about it last week, even like that's not enough anymore. Like mm-hmm. You, you need right. you need some other aspects. You need to be able to talk. You need to be able to pitch. You need to be able to have a conversation. You need to be yeah. uh, represent yourself, represent the brand. Um, no st- uh, stories, narratives. Like you have to be able to present it all. Uh, right. And just being able to use a camera and know the the exposure triangle. I don't think it's going to do it anymore. You yeah. know. Unless you're working for yeah. someone, and that's your that's your sole job, I, guess, I suppose. Yeah, I think we talked right. about how you can't be just good. I think we were speaking in the social media sense to stand out on social media. Everybody is so amazing. So, oh, here's a video of a wolf or, oh, here's this epic travel video. There's a million of those. So I think our point was, okay, in that sense, we got to be, be more than just what we're presenting. Uh, you know, and I think our example was including ourselves in, in little clips, but maybe this is a good question is being, is simply being talented or great good enough in the commercial sense where you're not looking for online visibility. You're not looking for any of that stuff. I mean, I suppose you could say it's always about being more than being really good. You know, you don't have to know how to network with people. You have to know the right things to say. You need to know when to back off, when to push. But, you know, I think that that is being good in the overall general sense or being really good or better than others. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So when you refer to good, I'm assuming you're talking about like creative skill, right? Yeah, just like from the raw sense of this person really knows how to work a camera. They know how to take a photo. Yeah. yeah. There's I mean, so many of those, so, right? Totally. And anymore, that's it's a commodity, right? Like there's mm-hmm. there's 15-year-olds that can operate a camera or can operate their phone in a very similar way that you know some professional corporations can do. And from what I've found, and this is really interesting, is the way you pitch yourself nowadays is not like, this is the quality of my work or it's better quality than somebody else. Um, Cause that's kind of originally how I was doing it. Um, mm. And they can always find someone who's going to be better. They can always find a production company that has, you know, more experience or has worked on bigger projects or whatever. Right. So if you're playing that game, then you can't really compete with a production company that's been in business for 40 years. You just can't. Right. Yeah. So the only right. option there is to lower your price, which you can only lower to zero. And if you're lowering to zero, like you don't have a business, it's a hobby, you may as well just go get a job, right? So the option, instead of doing that, that I've found is to actually differentiate yourself in a different way other than your creative, which was what we were talking about, of um, actually coming up with strategy for how brands can use the video. So instead of just mm-hmm. saying, hey, I'm going to shoot a 30 second ad for you and you can have a good day, have fun, right? We can actually come up with strategies of how they can use this content and strategies of what types of audiences we're hitting and why we're doing certain things. So then we almost become like a marketing strategist versus just solely an editor or solely a video production company. Um, I use this example right. sometimes it is, you know, say a company has a hundred thousand dollar ad budget um, to, to throw at a video, right? They could go hire some production company for a hundred G's and they could produce something that looks incredible. They could run it on TV, whatever. That doesn't mean they're going to get any kind of ROI on it though, right? Because maybe they produce a movie and it looks incredible, but it doesn't convert to any kind of sales form. So it's a waste of money, right? Mm-hmm. So, but on the flip side, you could pay, you could pay some kid 500 bucks to make a TikTok video 
that's shot on a phone. And if it hits the right audience at the right time with the right message, it could go viral, get whatever, you know, 10 million views and be the biggest ROI the company's ever had. So it becomes less about, uh, I guess, the actual tangible result of how it looks creatively and more about what kind of results that's bringing the company. And of course, as creatives, we want to make it look as good as possible. But the, the balance is how do we make it look as good as possible, but also take that aspect of the marketing with it so that now we can't be compared to other people, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does make sense. And I mean, to dig in pretty specific here, uh, mm-hmm. like you just said, a five second TikTok video that, I mean, could reach 500 million views uh, and have the best ROI that they that they've ever seen, you know, versus that hundred thousand dollar scripted thing with production. Let's close down this town. Like, you know, they're, they're spending a ton of money and it might, they might miss the mark. That five second clip might miss the mark, but it was a five second clip for probably not a hundred grand. That five second clip might hit the mark and, and and like that lotto effect just go, go bonkers. So when you're building in this sort of aspect, there is a little bit I mean, I don't know if there's a system that anyone understands the algorithm completely. Like this video yeah. will get 500 million views. I don't, I don't know if anyone can say that, but they have certain formulas that that might get a better chance of doing that. There might be certain things that have a better chance. Do you work that into your sort of return on investment for you in terms of a budget? Like, hey, I'm going to do this video. It's uh, at base rate, it's X. But right. if this goes nutty and it's going to return a ton of views and sales for you, uh, I expect this much more in terms of the budget. But that's only if it performs. Totally. Um, so there's a few different ways that I've personally done it. Um, so if it's just a one-off video, I actually haven't done that before, but I would probably use the similar concept to what what I'm about to say is uh, say I'm on a retainer where I shoot 15 short form videos for a company in a month, right? So that's, Mm -hmm. they're just going to post it organically and I'm not posting it to my page or anything. I'm just giving it to them. Now, so say it's just a flat rate of whatever, four grand for that. Now, say that one of those videos specifically does really well and they're like, hey, we could actually run this as an advertisement because obviously it killed it organically. Um, I give them the option to essentially license it as a commercial uh, ad, right? And then I take Mm -hmm. a percentage of whatever the revenue is, like if it's an e-com product, take a percentage of whatever revenue is generated off of that ad creative, Um, Mm -hmm. you know, so for the the duration of however long they want to run that for. So that way, obviously, you're incentivized to make the best product or the best creative possible. Mm -hmm. They're incentivized to just run it to the moon because it works for them. And then you get a kickback on doing good work. And another way that you can kind of do this is like, say you find something that works well organically, you can just take the exact same video, but film a different hook at the beginning. So a different like three or five second clip to put at the beginning and basically split test it. So you have almost unlimited versions of it. So. Yeah, that's smart. And, and just a technical question, like if they like, um, Again, let's say a TikTok or a reel that's 16 by nine vertically. And they're like, we want to run this as an ad. Are they talking, we want to just put money behind it on, on Instagram reels and, and, and play it the same way. Or are they saying, we want to make this like a TV ad and we're going to do it, you know, landscape 16 by nine horizontal. Yeah. Um, I, I'm just curious. I'm just curious in terms of your filming style. Like, do you go out being like, this is just going to be vertical. I, Maybe I'm asking because I always have an internal battle in my head with like, <laughs> which way do I want to film this? Because where's the final thing going to land and, and where's it going to look best? And then can I splice it to 16 by nine vertically or should I just start that way? Or will I be able to stretch it out the other way? So I'm, I'm just curious yeah. maybe in that. So uh, that's something that you would talk to the client in pre-pro like, hey, what are we going to mm-hmm. use this for? Um, if we're on a reels retainer, like the one that I just explained, then I'm probably going to shoot that, uh, vertical just because yeah, that's, that's where it's going to live. And when they run it as an ad, it would probably be on social. So on Instagram, TikTok, whatever it is right now, if they say, Hey, we want a version of this that we can have be horizontal in case we want to run it as a TV ad or just a horizontal, whatever YouTube ad or something, then I'll probably shoot that, uh, horizontal. And then if I have time, depending on how long the shoot's going to go, if I have time, whatever, then I might try to shoot that same shot 
um, vertical. Obviously, not all the time are you able to do that. You don't have the luxury of that all the time. Um, right. But for like, if I'll, I'll shoot resorts, right? And some of this mm-hmm. stuff, it's like we're shooting a shot of the, the the entrance, and there's nobody in the shot, so it's real easy to just flip the camera and get a, a vertical version of it. You know, for stuff mm-hmm. like that, then I'll do that just to make sure I cover my bases. Um, but if, if I know there's a chance that I'm going to have to have it be horizontal, then I'm going to shoot horizontal every time and then just crop in, um, for the Mm -hmm. shorts. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah, totally. I'm looking at your bio site right now, uh, you know, or Mm -hmm. link tree or whatever people want to call it. And, uh, you know, you have two links, your pricing calculator, free trial and make $10,000 a month shooting content. My question to you is, is, is maybe a two-parter. The first one is, and this may be a simple answer, why share that if it's a competitive industry? And what's your response to people who say, oh, if they really knew what they were doing, they wouldn't be like, they wouldn't need to sell it. You know, you ever see those kinds of comments? What do you you say to, yeah, what, what do you say to that? So I guess why share? Uh, and you know, I'm just saying this to explore, you know, this topic, of course we want to build up together. I don't want to give the impression that it's all about me. Um, but you know, it's a, it's a genuine question in a competitive industry, you know, potentially people can encroach on your, your revenue. And, uh, yeah, the second part, why do, um, what's your response to people who say, oh, if they were making that much money, they wouldn't be selling you a course or whatever. Right. Um, so there's a few answers to that. Um, first sure. one, if you look at my YouTube channel, um, I post pretty much exactly what to do. Um, I don't hold back. Like the stuff I talk about on my YouTube channel is stuff that people are charging two grand in a course for. Um, and right. the reason I do that is because I know that 99.7% of the people are going to watch it and do absolutely nothing with it. That's so it doesn't so sad. Matter. I know it's really sad. It's really sad, but it's just. Did you hear my genuine sadness? <laughs> yeah, I did. I saw a little tear. It's, it's I think. Just true. Now, now that we're on video, I see the tears. So um, we'll get back to that. We'll get back to that stat. I'm gonna let you finish your thought. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, I don't know if that's exact. So we, I, 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 I know, but like it's it's up there for sure. It's yeah. up there for sure. No, I don't mean literally. Yeah, because like think about what it takes to to run a successful creative business. Like you guys obviously know this, but you first of all you have to be good at the creative. Second of all, you have to actually get clients results because like they could hire you, and if you don't get them results, then they're going to find someone else, right? You have mm-hmm. to know how to run a business in terms of the accounting, the marketing, how to run sales calls, how to constantly be getting uh, influx of bookings or influx of calls that you can close potentially. Um, the systems behind everything, like there's a lot to it. Right. Mm-hmm. And most people, they'll they'll see somebody like you guys or myself and they'll be like, oh, that's sick. They're traveling the world and they're shooting for four seasons. It looks like something I could do. And they probably could if they actually put in the work to be able to do all these things. But once you see everything that's involved, it it becomes a lot more intimidating for a lot of people. And it's easier to say, well, I'll just go work for this marketing company and shoot their photos for them, because then all I have to do is be creative and I don't have to worry about the business side, which is totally fine if people want to do that. Right. Um, but that's, that's kind of the, the first thing that kind of my philosophy of that. The second thing is, uh, I genuinely want to give back to people because when I was first starting out, there was absolutely nothing out there that, like I said, I would copy and paste blogs of scripts and it just wouldn't work. And I was like, why doesn't this work? So what I give people is not scripts, but it's more frameworks and ways, ways to think. So they can think Mm -hmm. for themselves on how to actually do these things. Because a lot of the stuff I talk about is, um, it's like, it's ambiguous. It's stuff that, you know, you you do have to think about like, okay, if I'm reaching out to this marketing manager, where are they in their life? What would allow them to get a promotion? What would their job or what would their uh, boss say like, hey, this is a great job. I'm going to give you a raise for like, what kind of things can we actually offer a marketing manager that they're able to look like the hero for the company? And that's not a script you can give. It's not a framework. It's going to be different for everybody. Um, right. But when you talk about that stuff, then it uh, it gives people that actually care and actually want to do this, then they reach out and they ask questions. And then uh, I don't actually sell a course personally. I sell a mentorship program and a, a system basically um, for getting more leads and more bookings and, and more clients in general. Um, so, I mean, courses are great for basic information and that's why I have my YouTube channel for free. But I think when it comes to getting to the next level, you really need to have the insight 
of somebody who's been there before. Um, and also like the systems in place to be able to actually get yourself to that level. Cause maybe you're reaching out to hundred companies a day, but if you don't have the ability to take on that many calls or you don't know how to run the sales calls, then it, it becomes very difficult. So, um, yeah, that's, that's another reason is it's just a different, uh, market, I guess I'm, I'm promoting too. Okay. And speaking cool. on free knowledge right now, and you mentioned sales calls, you mm-hmm. perhaps not knowing how to run a sales call off the top of your head. What are some of the biggest mistakes people make? in a a failed sales call? One of the biggest ones is not taking authority right off the bat. So Mm. a lot of times creators will, will get on a call and they'll be like, what do you want? Or that's, that's the general vibe of asking the client what they want. And the fact is if the client knew what they wanted, most of the time, if they're coming from a cold email, they, they probably wouldn't get on the call with you. They would just say, Hey, this is what we need. Right? So when you approach the sales call from like a diagnostics point of view of like, hey, where's your business? Who are your competitors? Uh, what are some of your goals for this year? What's preventing you from getting there? What have you tried in the past? Why do you think it didn't work? Like those kind of questions allow you to diagnose where a client is in their business. And then you can come in and provide a solution to them. But if you're just saying, hey, how many photos do you want? Or, or a lot of people, the sales call will be just going and pitching them right off the bat for something they don't even know if the client needs because they haven't even expressed any any kind of pain point yet. Um, so really trying to uncover what that pain point is, is first and foremost what you need to do. And then showing why your solution in terms of content is the best option for them to get to their desired end goal. Um, yeah. Right. Now, a, p- a pain point is, I assume just like it sounds, uh, <laughs> an area in their business where maybe they're lacking. Maybe yeah. maybe they're on social media with zero video content uh, this day and age. And you go like, hey, uh, this would help. You know, yeah. is that a correct assumption for everyone listening? For my mom totally. out there? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, that's, yeah, so that's, that's part of it. Um, but sometimes it's not just like, hey, you need to be posting whatever, 10 videos a month on your social just for the sake of having it because it's the 21st century, we have to get to why does that matter for them? Um, So what is posting 10 videos a month going to do for their business? Like, yes, they might get more followers. Yes, they might get more engagement. But what does that do for them specifically? Um, So in the case of a brand, it could be that we're building brand image, but we're also directing traffic straight to their link tree or their direct website link. Um, cause when we're talking about brands, they're running paid ad campaigns mostly, right? So they're going to be spending a certain amount of money per lead that comes to their website. Whereas when they use content on their social, yes, they're going to pay you up front for it, but it's essentially free marketing for the duration that that piece of content is on their, on their social media and can direct mm-hmm. people to the page where they can see more stuff, get nurtured further. Um, and there's also, maybe we can talk about this as well. Um, but there's different types of content. So there's there's like viral content. That's really the entire point of that is just to get views, to get people's attention, to get people to look at you, right? Um, that's the whole point of it. And that's the part that most people focus on. But the thing is, there's also other pieces of content that are necessary to uh, for the entire sales funnel for a brand, right? So if we're just all posting trends and stuff, then we don't actually build brand. It's just like, you know, we're, we become the trend page. So you have to have uh, branding stuff. So that's like, what are some initiatives that the brand has? Um, you know, are they eco-friendly? Are they sustainable? Um, what is the brand story? What is the founder story? Like getting into that kind of stuff. It's not going to go viral. The numbers aren't going to be as sexy as, you know, some of this other stuff, but that's okay because it's, it's geared more towards the people that are already like embedded in the brand. And then another one is like the educational side of things, which is kind of on, on par with, uh, brand, but that could be more so things like sales or promotions that are coming up, events, um, or just general education about the product um, and why it matters to them. So again, that's not going to be as uh, viral as the viral pieces, but that serves well in terms of getting people to their website. Um, so when you can pitch like a full content strategy like that, it it just sets you apart because it sounds like you know what you're talking about. It sounds like you're not just making a video for the sake of it but you actually have a plan of, of how they're going to use it. Now, question for you. I know you mentioned that one of the big mistakes is not taking authority and that yeah. 
if you're on a call like this, you're the one in charge, you're the creative, you should be really helping fill some gaps here or locating those pain points. Now we had a guest two weeks ago where her view is more of the side of, and maybe this is because she sort of knows what she's doing with social media and her own strategy, but don't tell me what I need, ask me what I need, or don't try and come in and, you know, don't assume, of, yeah, don't assume you, don't assume you, you know, know my you, business and what I'm trying right. to do. So she was a little put off because I, I basically asked that same exact question. Like, would this be helpful if someone pitched you with, um, Hey, I noticed this problem. Uh, I can solve it. I'm curious if you're interested is as simple as that. And right, yeah. reasonably it's her opinion. She was, she was just like, no, I'm, I'd be kind of put off by that. Um, yeah. because you're assuming like, you don't know what I'm trying to do my own strategy. Um, so I'm, I'm curious. Seth, yeah. I was thinking the same thing. Yeah, yeah. So we were on the same page. I'm just curious if A, you ever run into that or if maybe we're talking about two different kinds of clients, maybe at two different stages, something along those lines. So, or what do you just think of that comment in general? Yeah. Is is this from like, say, a cold email and somebody responds is like, hey, that's not actually something we need. Is that what you're saying? Or is it on the sales call itself? I think it would be more cold, right, Aaron? Tough to say. Yeah, I suppose, we didn't dig too but, much into that. <laughs> Nash, to your point, you th- there's a preliminary. There's there's the right. research that you said, and the maybe there's conversations where you're you're getting a feel of their company, and then you come back with a based on our our conversation, based on my research, uh, I propose this uh, yes. because X, Y, and Z, and I would hope that it would return X, Y, and Z. Well, you know what? Yeah. This begs the question before we even start. How do you in your, you know, if you can share some strategies, how you acquire that sales call, how you get them on the phone, because, you know, it could be a simple email as to what we're talking mm-hmm. about. Hey, is there anywhere where your business needs help in the, in the scenario we were talking about? They could be, no, nah, I'm good. Essentially. Now I know what right. my business needs. And then you never actually get on that, that sales call. Yeah. So I guess that really so, begs the question, how are you convincing people to give you 15, 30 minutes of your time? Right. Yeah. So I guess converting yeah. them from a text to an in-person meeting, which we know always goes better. <laughs> yeah, 100%, <laughs> for sure. You know? Yeah. So uh, it, it comes down to this mindset that uh, depending on what brand you're reaching out to, if it's a local company, they might not get hit up at all. If you're reaching out to someone like DJI, they're getting thousands of inquiries every single day. So you got to be able mm-hmm. to stand out. So you got to yeah. understand who you're talking to, number one. Um, but most people are probably not going to, that's not going to be their first person they reach out to. They're not going to reach out to a massive Fortune 500 mm-hmm. company. Um, so that being said, either way, you have to increase the intrigue in your first initial email and you have to decrease the friction to engaging with you further. So the entire point of the email is not to pitch them. It's not to sell them on your solution. It's not, not to do any of that. It's basically just to say that you noticed them, that you noticed a certain inefficiency in their business. Let's say, for example, they're not posting consistently and what they have been posting is just, you know, it's not converting based on how many comments it gets based on the views and and you could do a lot better, right? So you can point out like, hey, I noticed that you haven't been very consistent and then you can drop a case study. Um, So if you have your own case study, that's ideal, right? If you can say, hey, I helped this company go from posting basically nothing to posting 15 times a month and this is what happened to their page, then that creates intrigue. Or if you can just make a like a quote, right, from Adam Masseri, the, the CEO of Instagram, that says that uh, Instagram is a, a video platform. And if you're not posting video, then, then you're missing out, right? So like mm-hmm. if you can quote something or a specific case study, then that's ideal. Then you can say, I'd love to get you similar results to this. Or you can even make a specific claim um, of what you're trying to do that is bold, but is something that you can actually attain right? That it, that backs up from that case study. And so that all creates intrigue. And we're, we're doing that in like four sentences. We're not writing a book to them. We're, we're doing it in like four or five sentences. And then the last line, we don't want, what's that? The whole email is four to five sentences? Um, that first part. So right. okay. total, you might be looking at like six, seven, maybe something like that. Um, right. So that first part is just to create intrigue. Um, so if, if we look at the anatomy of an email, what's the point of the subject line? to get somebody to open it. That's literally the only point. Um, So we got to stand out, right? What's the point of personalizing an email? It's just to create the connection so someone wants to read further. 
what's the point of sharing these case studies and our results? Literally just to create intrigue and be like, oh, wow, that's interesting that they did that. And then when we get to the call to action point, we're not pitching a service. We're not saying we can do this amount of deliverables for this price or anything like that. We're, we just say something like, hey, if you want to know the exact strategy that I've used to get these types of results for that client I shared, then just reply yes, and I'll share it with you. So all they have to do is just type yes or say I'm interested. Like zero real, friction. Real smart. Yeah. So, so zero friction. And then when they mm-hmm. say yes, all, all you do is you share a quick, uh, you could share a Loom video where you explain it in like five minutes, or you could do like three bullet points where you're like, hey, I'm going to do this type of video, this type of video, this type of video. Um, this is what we did for the client. This is how their page changed. This is what I want to do for you. If you're interested in learning more about this, I'd love to hop on a call and I can explain it more in depth and exactly how it applies to you. Here's a, a link to, to book a call with me. And then, and then boom, then they're, they've already showed interest and you've explained the whole thing, how it's relevant to them. And then it makes it so much easier to get them on a call. Dude, I, I freaking love that. Yeah. I love, I love that. that. Just, <laughs> just reply. Yes. Just reply. <laughs> yes. Zero friction. So now, you yes. know, if you need to spend, I mean, there's nothing worse than crafting an entire email with links and this and that and, and getting yeah. nothing back. It's like, that was a lot yeah. of work for, for nothing. So a quick email to the point, are you interested in me then explaining more? Yes or mm-hmm. no? Like, yes. Yeah. Okay, great. And then I love further the the video presentation. Now they get a sense of your personality. Can you speak on camera? What do you look like? What's your style like? Uh, and yeah. you can explain a lot in words really quickly and give them a, a quick video where they feel more comfortable probably with you now going forward yeah. in, in terms of like, yeah, I could get on a call with this guy or girl. Uh, like, yeah. no problem. You know, and I, I just think that's brilliant. Then, I then you know, blasting them with another 500, 5,000 character email where they look at it and they're like, uh, I'm going to lunch and then it's gone yeah. forever, you <laughs> know? Sorry. So if there's one yeah. video file, it automatically, I would think would be like, huh, like what's that? Like, let me press play. Yeah. Oh, it's five minutes long. Like I'm going to get to this later, but I'm curious what's behind this video. Yep. I love it. Yeah. hundred percent. And the reason that works so well, because if you, if you shoot out a video cold on the, the first email, then you're risking them having zero context for it and also probably Mm -hmm. not even watching it because they're, you know, they're, they're giving five minutes of their life to some random person that emailed them. But when you get that first commitment of, yes, I'm interested, then they're committed to at least learning more about it. So they're much more likely to watch that video. Um, Mm -hmm. And when you do it that way, that first email, you can templatize for the most part without, with the exception of the little personalization that you make. Um, yeah. so you're not like hyper personalizing every single email you send so you can do it more at scale. That was going to be, you literally use the exact same terminology I was going to use. I was going to ask you, how do you scale that in terms of customizing the next step with video? You must have several templates that fit different scenarios. Yeah. You're, you're talking the first initial email. Yeah. After the, yeah. after yes, no, after, after you've gotten yes as a reply and you're on mm-hmm. to the video stage, are you customizing every single one of those videos? There's no way you can scale that, right? No. And again, it depends on the client, right? If, right. if it's a dream client, somebody like DJI, then yeah, I'm going to pull out this stuff right. and, okay. and make something really good. Um, right. But if it's just a client that, that you're like, you know, it's not a dream client, but it's somebody I want to get, whatever. Um, I create what's called a VSL. So a video sales letter. And essentially, it's like that five to seven minutes long. And uh, are you guys familiar with video sales letters, how it works? Not at all. No, not until okay. right now. And I'm, I'm blown <laughs> away at how dumb I am that I've never awesome. even thought of this or heard of it and not used okay. it. Like, I, I'm literally blown away. So tell me the VSL. Give me the VSL. Yeah. So to be honest, so, so I got super into the whole marketing thing, right? And a lot of people who are in the marketing game use VSLs. So uh, like click funnels, they're huge on it, right? But in terms of the creator industry, like literally no one uses it. Um, I have never seen anyone else use it. So that's why it's so dangerous because like you can stand apart immediately because of it. So essentially what your goal is, is to to give proof that you know what you're talking about. Um, So it's easy to show footage that you've shot before. So you're not sending them a a website portfolio, but you immediately have footage. You immediately have client lists. Um, And then you give a case study, like your, your most bomb case study that you have of the results that you've gotten the client. Um, Basically, we want to say that 
they're in the situation that they're in and it's not their fault. Um, it's because they were, you know, ignorant to something and you're not going to use the word ignorant, obviously, but, um, they, they didn't understand something about the business and that's okay that they didn't understand that. But once they implement this thing, which is your content strategy, it's going to do wonders for their business. It's going to be completely different and it's going to get results similar to this case study that we mentioned. Um, so Mm. in my specific example, what I'll do is I call it the social accelerator program. Um, and this is for like my social retainers. Um, so I have different VSLs depending on like what kind of, what kind of project I'm trying to pitch. Um, but I'll talk about how most clients will just post up a video and hope it works. And that's not, that's not how social algorithms work. That's not how the sales funnel in general works because businesses get clients first by getting attention, then by nurturing that attention, then by getting that attention to go to some kind of sales page. And then lastly, converting that attention which means that we have to get attention through virality. Okay, so we need to create viral content. We need to nurture that uh, audience by creating branding type of videos. Why should we care about your resort? Why is your resort better than the 50 other ones that are within the one mile radius on this strip of beach, right? Um, and, And like, how do we specifically target your target market and speak their language on that? Then once people are stoked about that, we have to have some kind of way to get them onto a website. So we need to have, you know, those educational pieces or or some kind of call to action piece of content that gets somebody to click a link in the bio, right? Once they're on the website, we have to have conversion assets because somebody can go to a website, but if it sucks, then they're just going to click off, think it's a scam, not want to book there, whatever, right? So we need to have conversion uh, assets on the website that allow people to believe in the, in the resort or believe in the brand, think that it's going to get them the transition they want or the experience they want, and therefore they book. So content is critical for every single aspect of that sales funnel. And when you're missing any single part of that, then you're just missing out on a complete uh, section of the sales funnel. So that's what I want to do. That's what we want to fix. And this is how I want to do it. But to be able to explain it further, let's jump on a call and I can tailor it specific to your company and we can see if it works. Now, are you doing this all on your own? Yeah. Do you have, do you well, have like a team? I mean, I mean the, the video? No, just the, the whole process. The, like your, your business, is this, yeah. is this you? So um, I do a lot of the shoots. I do outsource some of the shoots, like the ones that I don't want to do as much. So I do that. Um, so I have contractors. Um, I also have a sales guy a closer. So he takes Mm -hmm. on all my sales calls now. Um, in the past I was doing it all, but I kind of trained him on doing that. Um, and I actually am in the process right now of hiring an outbound team. Um, so I'm training them up to basically do all my outbound for me. So I don't have to do any of the initial outreach and, uh, yeah, basically duplicate myself. So, and I also have an editor. So amazing. Amazing. Yeah. It gets really. to a point where you need a team. I mean, we're, we're starting, we're probably a little bit behind you with our own business, but like we're getting to a point with the show where like we need a team, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. otherwise you you have no life. You have no, like, totally. you, you're, you're totally invested into hustle culture. And maybe that's for somebody where you, you know, you're going to bed at three and up at five and you're disappearing and all you're doing is working on your business. And that's not for me. Yeah. I don't think that's sustainable for anyone. No. You know, we're yeah, we're here good. to have fun. We're here to have a joyous life. <laughs> and you know, yeah. building a business is fun, right? But like they're, Maybe you want to go surf, you know, maybe you want to go rock climbing, <laughs> yeah. you know, maybe you want to go do those things. Mm-hmm. My question for you, Seth. Aaron, hold on, hold Aaron, on, Seth. Camera. Thank you. It's still going though. Okay. I checked. Uh, while we took this pause though, everyone look at the camera and say, hey to Taryn and she's going to be editing this. Maybe. So speaking of a team, just look at the camera and just say, hey, Taryn. Which camera? There's like show. four of them on me. <laughs> The the real one, the your Osmo. Uh, your Osmo. The computer. Hey Taryn, oh, thanks for okay. editing this. Hey, Taryn. hey, thanks for editing. <laughs> thanks, Aaron. You're the best. Yeah. Um, no, the camera's still going, so let's we can keep going. Cool. My question to build off of sort of what you're talking about is are you creating content that hits all of those those what would be the term? Those areas attention, nurture, conversion, or mm-hmm. Does it depend or sometimes you only pitching, Hey, I'll create you content. That's just for the attention part. looks like you got everything else covered or just for the nurture part. Right. Uh, yeah, totally depends on the brand. Right. So sometimes brands will have the viral side down. Like they, they built the page and they have a bunch of people coming in. Um, but they don't have any of the nurture or conversion side of things. So that's, I would tailor the pitch more towards that. Now the video sales letter is going to talk about all three of them. 
and why they're important so that you can just scale that and just, just send it out to everybody. Um, but when it comes to the actual sales call, uh, we'll tailor that specifically to the brand, specifically to what they need. Um, so that's on the social side of things. Now, sometimes there'll be, for example, a resort that needs updated room photos or they just underwent a renovation or something like that. And the, obviously the most of that stuff is kind of irrelevant to them. So what, what's more important to them is to showcase the, the new design of the room or to showcase uh, the new renovations or whatever it might be, or if they have a restaurant or sometimes... Uh, this mm -hmm. is another thing with resorts is they'll have like events or they'll have a celebrity chef come in. So they're constantly updating, constantly having these new little like marketing initiatives or whatever that they need content for. Um, cause you can just post a photographic that you make in Canva, but it's not really going to do much for you. Whereas, you know, making a video, obviously, as you guys know, is going to be much more engaging for that. So it, mm -hmm. you got to tailor it to the client depending on what they need. Um, but you can templatize a lot of like the specific processes. It's really smart. I mean, it, it just really is. I think with this day and age, everything's so fast paced, uh, video is king. I mean, why, why not translate that to everyday life, to email, to pitching, to like, here it is. Like it, it's the next best step versus getting on like a zoom call together. Like yeah. here, here's the movement. Here's the life. Here's the life behind what I can do quickly just to pitch you or talk to you about uh, the sales funnel. Like mm -hmm. look at the quality of this video that's happening right now. It, it yeah. checks off like a lot of question marks that an email does not. I mean, email right. can be written. You could chat GBT, like make a wonderful pitch for uh, Marriott in, uh, you know, Key West and it will. Yeah. And like, but yeah. that doesn't, that doesn't give a lot of the question marks. Like who's going to be filming? Like what's the person look like? What's the demographic? Like what's right. their attitude? What's their work ethic? Like it doesn't, it doesn't give any of that, which this, this yeah. VSL yeah. does. It's Aaron's new favorite thing. VSL. VSL. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I do. I do have to ask a. I do have to ask a. I think a tough question because this is where maybe fear comes in, and, and working past that fear is yeah. your. You're researching, but you you're you're promising an unknown. Sometimes, yeah. I mean, I mean, you might have an idea, you might have a probability or a hope, but you're kind of promising an unknown. Like someone's yeah. page might just not work, or your your video might not strike what they're hoping. They might be hoping, oh, this guy's coming on, like it's going to go viral, and then it's a yeah. slow trickle, or it, it starts to come up. Are there return uh, return emails or return videos or calls where they're like? Hey man, like you, you promised X, Y, and Z and like, we're not seeing it. Like, how do you, how yeah. do you turn that around or does that happen? It must happen sometimes. Um, and, yeah. and what's the attitude behind that? Because that fear for, I'm feeling that fear of, of promising a company like, Hey, if I do this video for you, I think it'll go viral on your page when, I mean, who, who just, who knows, who knows? Right. Yeah. And that comes down to, to what you guarantee, right? Can you guarantee the thing is going to get 2 million views? No, no one can. Like it could be the best video. You could copy a video that has 2 million views and post it on their mm -hmm. page and it might not get that. Right. So setting those expectations up front of like, Hey, we're going to follow frameworks that have proven to work for these companies. And you can even show them examples of like, Hey, this template worked for this company that we want to apply to yours. Now, is it going to be the same? No, because you're a different property, you're a different page, like you've been around a different amount of time, different audience, all that kind of stuff, right? Um, different timing even, like sometimes just the timing of when it is, maybe it hits a trend or whatever, right? So there's so many different factors. So you just have to set the expectations of like, hey, we're going to do our best to do exactly what we did with this company, but we can't guarantee it's going to perform exactly how it is. It might even be better. Who knows? Um, yeah. But That's yeah, true. you take the expectation away, I guess, in terms of, you know, tangible, like it's going to hit yeah. this exact number. It's more like this worked yeah. here. This is what we right. want to replicate. Hopefully it, right. it does well. It's not going to be right. worse. It's going to get you on the right path. A, a follow-up question to that in terms of detail is like, everyone's different in terms of their, their social media marketer or their marketer or, um, you know, Seth and I do some Airbnb stays and, and content for Airbnbs and we might have a pitch or we might do a, a certain theme or narrative or celebrate a holiday for them that's coming up, yeah. like things like that. But you hand over the content and unless, I mean, I can't tell you how many times a reel gets posted and like the music's 
maybe they even forgot music or trending music or they don't do the caption or a thing and you're like ah oh, like uh, like I don't have the final say on like when this goes out, how often it goes out, or maybe they're doing the real like once every three weeks. And you're like, I gave you, you know, 20 for the month, hoping mm-hmm. you would do them every week to see that growth and, 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 and feel that like, Oh, I hired this guy and I have this great return on investment. Where does that sort of control? Where do you let go of the like, okay, like it, now it's on you guys. Or yeah. is it really spelled out all the way to the end? Like, hey, I want you posting on Monday through Friday at 11, p- 11 a.m. or like whatever it is. Is it yeah. so spelled out? So that's when we get into things like offers, right? So what makes you guys as Airbnb shooters different than anybody else who shoots an Airbnb? Because anyone can go shoot a video and hand it over to the client, right? Mm-hmm. But what could make you guys different, an example is when you can solve every single problem the client has. So maybe they're lazy, maybe they don't know, maybe they just completely forget that they even hired you and that's why they're not posting, right? So how do we take care of that issue? Well, we can offer like a automated posting schedule for them or we can even post it ourselves, we can hire VA. There's all kinds of different options that we can do where we basically handle that portion of the business for them so that it, it doesn't end up looking bad on us, right? So that's something that we can do Um, That's something I've done with clients before that they'll have a, uh, like a marketing agency that specializes quote unquote in posting the, uh, the social media content for the company. And it's just not very good. Right. And then they hire me to, to shoot content and I'm like, Hey, I see what you guys have. This is what you're posting right now. How do you like your, your current setup with your social media agency? And a lot of times they're like, Oh, we're locked into a contract for the next year with them, but we really don't like what, what they're producing for us. So the response to that could be like, okay, well, since I'm already producing the content for you guys, I know the strategy, I know why we're producing it, I know what the best captions will be, when to post it, all that kind of stuff. Wouldn't it make sense to just bring me on to actually do the posting, handle the posting side of it so that you guys don't have to worry about that at all and you're not handling like two different vendors? Like it just makes more sense. And a lot of times they actually appreciate that because you have you have the firsthand perspective of why it works because you become the strategist instead of just the guy handing over videos. Um, plus it just looks better for everybody and it's easier to stay on retainer that way. Um, because uh, here's another way you can do it is like, say you initially shoot 15 videos, but you can just reorganize the clips in the videos, put a different song on it. And now all of a sudden you have a month's worth of content, um, Mm -hmm. that you didn't have before, but they, but you can still charge them the monthly retainer for it. Um, so there's just all kinds of advantages for that. That's a great point. Again, um, you know, it, 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 there's so many just avenues to business. There's so many avenues to this whole game where it's like, it doesn't have to stop at content. Mm-hmm. It doesn't just have to be content. Like I can give you 25 videos and you know, 50 photos like, and then that's it. But like, what are you going to do yeah. with them? Do you, do you have a plan? Because I can help you with that too. Uh, yeah. And for a price, like mm-hmm. I will take my time to, for the next two months, you'll have a post every day. Let's see what growth we can do. And if it's great, yeah. Hey, you want to continue this now hire me to get some more content and then I'll continue the two months. Let's do another two months, see where we're at. And then Mm -hmm. it's once you take, I feel also with, with, with business, with life, you take something, you take a chore off someone's plate, Mm -hmm. take it off their plate. They don't, they don't want it back. As long as you're doing a decent job, they don't want it back. Mm. Right. Like time is money, you know? Mm -hmm in terms of you know seth in terms of editing like seth edited all these podcasts we yeah. finally said you know we, we got to give this to someone else we got to free up some time and seth someone who's want, better yeah on top yeah. of it right a little <laughs> better i almost went way better how dare you sir, <laughs> dare you, sir? <laughs> i'm kidding uh the tiniest bit better dex the tiniest bit better but uh my point being that if seth were being honest i'm like do you want that do you want that back? Absolutely like, not. That chore is gone, and now it's freed up. So once not you that I'm get above that, it though, just because I, I have so much more time to do other things, and I'm of course. rest easy knowing someone who's better than me at that task hasn't handled. Oh, absolutely. So you know, and that and that's business. Like, how can I help you? And it costs money. You but then you wait, you 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 budget for that, and you realize my time is worth that amount being spent. Or we decide that realistically. 
Yep. You know, yeah. I think what's, what's also been really fascinating about this discussion and something that's I've wanted to kind of blurt out, even though it's already been said, but really hammer home is the data is inarguable. So when you're talking about case studies or here's my framework or here's my strategy that works 80% of the time or it worked for this person or it worked for this company, that's inarguable. You can't right. argue with objective, concrete data. Mm-hmm. So I like that idea of running your own case study, even if it's you know small scale. If the results yeah. are there, you can scale that over time, I'm sure. So that's definitely something that you know I've taken note of. 100%. Um, and I think something to note on the case study thing is that a lot of people confuse case studies with portfolio. Um, so mm-hmm. they'll go and they'll Good take point. free shoots for, uh, you know, for a hotel or they'll take free shoots for a brand, which is fine if you're building portfolio. Um, but they'll never get a testimonial. They'll never figure out any kind of like tangible results of where that content was used. As far as we know, like, yes, it's on your personal portfolio, but maybe the client never even used it. Maybe they didn't like it. Who knows? Right. So mm-hmm. Whenever you do free work, it's yes, you want to get the portfolio, but even more important than that is some sort of testimonial or some sort of just tangible result that came as, as a result of you working with this client, um, because that's going to be infinitely more valuable than a free stay or a free product or uh, just throwing some stuff on your website, you know? Yeah, yeah absolutely. You endorsement. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to, to that point, when you're, whenever you're doing, or whenever I'm doing something new or find myself in a new situation, and let's say it's mm-hmm. uh, centered around social media. I'm always taking a screenshot of where their page was and what it looked like before, let's just say my 15 photos showed up. Mm, and smart. now I have like a, even if their following grew, you know, whatever, uh, 10%. You can uh, argue you can, it. You can still say yeah. like, "Hey, I did this, and within a month, the following grew ten percent." And you can you can change stats and and move stats and shape shift stats to make it seem pleasing in whatever you're trying to prove. But if there is growth behind and after what you've done, I think it's really good to show that. Especially if you're like taking over an account, like let me post for you for two months. Like, sh- hey, uh, our last post we got you know a thousand views. When I started, we got twenty five. Yeah. You know, like even to be able to say that is whatever percent increase that is a, a bajillion. Like a I don't know if that math's right. right. But yeah. but yeah, to be able to, to be able to say that or those little things, I think it's important to keep track of like, hey, where were they before they worked with me? And mm-hmm. where are they after? And what can I show from that? Yeah. Yeah, 100 percent. That's and, and that's what when we were talking about case studies in your initial email, that's what creates intrigue. It's not necessarily like, hey, I worked with you know, name drop random brands, like that's cool, but so have a lot of other people. So, but when you can show that actual result, that's when you set yourself apart. And that's when they're like, okay, all these other content creators are pitching me to do 10 photos and two reels, but this guy is actually pitching me like a tangible ROI. And like, here's proof that that actually works. I'm going to talk to him because Mm -hmm. he seems like he knows what he's talking about. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. I think that's spot on. Yeah, totally. This is this is why Seth, I enjoy this show because I'm sitting here, <laughs> like I've never pitched a brand before. Like that's what it feels like. Like mm-hmm. the, you just keep learning. You keep learning yeah. like these little things. And I I commend you for putting it out there for you know free. It's not free for you. Like the the time and the effort, but to put that stuff out there to get conversations going and and get you know people thinking. And I mean it, it's really awesome. I I think there's just so much that's out there that people can take. And I guess the choice becomes, like you said, do they want to, you know, really make the moves and, and have a further conversation with you. And there's that sales funnel, get the interest. And if they are, if they're serious, they're going to want to have a conversation with you. So it it works in every, every sort of, not even even necessarily serious. Maybe they want to fast track results. Maybe they can learn everything they need to know from Nash's free videos. Maybe, you know, maybe they want to speed that process up by having Mm -hmm. guidance for their own unique scenario because every, it doesn't matter, no business or no brand or is going to be the exact same in terms of how you're pitching, even if you have a strategy or template. I mean, it's just, there's going to be different variables no matter what. There's an infinite amount of permutations. So, I mean, I think there's something to be said for that. And back to, you know, something I said at the start of the episode was maybe there's some people who just the way 
like if two different, two or three different people are saying the exact same thing in terms of how to grow your, your photography business, you're going to vibe or understand just through better, you know, communicative connection, what Nash is saying or what person B is saying. It's all how it's presented and personalities play such a big role in how we understand information. So there's going to be people who vibe with Nash. There's going to be people who maybe don't understand as much as somebody else. And I think that's really interesting. And that's why I think we can all, not we, but in certain industries, you know, companies or people can pitch the same service of le- or same tutorials and, you know, get so many different kinds of clients. Yeah. Yeah. hundred um, percent. I mean, transparently the goal in my free videos is to get a photographer from zero to like three to 5,000 a month. Like that's my goal is if you just watch my videos that you can get there. Um, right. Then once you want to get further, then let's talk and I can help you work with bigger brands, bigger budgets, licensing deals, all that kind of stuff. Um, so like I get people all the time that DM me screenshots of like, Hey, I was just getting free collabs or I was getting denied all the time, but I just closed a $3,000 deal just from watching your YouTube videos. Mm-hmm. And that's like, that gets me stoked. Like so when sick. I use stuff like yeah. that, I'm like, that's awesome. You know? Well, because it gives you a sense of purpose, right? 10% sent to rainy Hawaii. 10% (laughs) sent to rainy Hawaii. (laughs) Yeah. That's what you should DM back. Yeah. Totally. You know? Yeah. No, 100%. So like, even if if it's just about the money, you wouldn't do anything, right? You wouldn't, you wouldn't make videos. You wouldn't do any, you just keep it all to yourself. So, I mean, there's an inherent, there's clearly an inherent need to contribute back. Totally. And I like this, this gets deeper into it, but I feel like the, the pulse of culture is driven by art, driven by art, right? Whether it's music, whether it's movies, whether it's videos on YouTube, whatever it is, right? Like the way the culture goes is through art. But if artists are like, they, they can't produce because they can't make a living, then, then what are we left with? We're left with mm-hmm. not very many and probably not that great because they're selling out. So how do we get artists to be able to understand the business side of stuff so they can actually charge what they're worth. Cause I hate the whole starving artist thing, freelance. Like my motto is taking yeah. the free out of freelance. Um, and, and how do we have them like create an actual living for themselves so they don't have to focus on like taking any job that'll give them 500 bucks, but like focus on things that they actually care about and then go and tell right. the stories that need to be told. So, yeah. I think that's great. And uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, to add to that, Seth and I, we really talk about, I think we have an episode called like, don't give away the farm. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, like knowing your worth and they're the artist usually is that, you know, left, left brain, emotional, nice person that (laughs) wants to be appreciated for their art. And like, even I think that's where it's gotten out of hand where it's like, there's no dentist or surgeon that's like, as long as you're like, as long as you'll tell your friends about it, like I'll do this for free. Like, you, right. you know, it, it, there's, there's associated value with that skill. Yet artists, there's so much value in someone liking your art that mm-hmm. you can easily be taken advantage of. And yeah. Granted, they're allowed to take advantage if we're allowing it. So we really just promote like knowing the value and being careful with trading for this and trading for experience, trading for exposure, like that kind of language um, and and knowing the worth. And if we all rise up, if the tide all rises, then Mm -hmm. it just makes it better for everyone. So I think giving that education out to people um, readily is, is just very, very important. Yeah, so hundred percent. Bravo, for sure. Thanks. Bravo. And you guys, too. you guys are doing awesome. Well, th- well, thank you, thank you. <laughs> we do, we do what we can. <laughs> yeah. Seth, well, any more questions? No, I'm just when my brain starts uh, yeah. the end of an episode, I mean it's a good sign. So, I mean, I've said it before. We have the pleasure of having you know folks like yourself on weekly, and we get a free education too, just like all of our listeners. Yeah. So, just wanted to. Um, you know, thank you once again for offering up your time. I know we said it here and we've said it a million times on this show that time is money. So thanks Nash for coming on and, and sharing all that you did today. And, um, you know, his link is link, uh, what is it? Biosite, his Instagram and biosite is in the episode description. You can click on that for you, those of you listening and you can find, uh, all his pages, check out some of those, uh, those free tutorials and his YouTube and all that good stuff. Is there anything else that you want to add Nash? 
Uh, yeah. I mean, honestly, like we go way more in depth on my YouTube channel. So like I talked about, you know, people are landing deals just off of those videos. So if you want to check it out, mm-hmm. it's Nash underscore Hagen. Um, if you guys could drop the link there. Um, so yeah, I have, I have tons of stuff from how to get deals if you don't have case studies to how to properly pitch clients, how to structure an email, what they care about, um, how to price yourself, licensing deals, like all that kind of stuff is on the YouTube for free. So yeah. Amazing. That's in the episode description, folks. That's sick. I, I, I feel like we're going to need a part two and maybe dive into <laughs> some some it. more specifics with this. Uh, I'll tell you what point. we do, Aaron. Um, i tell you what we do. We do the free course on YouTube. Watch them all. Mm-hmm. Do a case study and we could be a case study for Nash. Come back there on the go. show a year from now and let's see what's up. That would be sick. Yeah. That's, not a, that's not a bad idea. See where we're at? We'll have grown. You'll have grown. Mm-hmm. Just saying. That would be awesome. <laughs> Nash, I have, I have one quick question because yeah. since I was watching your videos, I this is the one thing that hit me is you're doing these major resorts, uh, these beautiful places. Uh, how do you get the people out of the freaking way? Like, how is it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, like, what time yeah. of day are you filming this resort? And there's there's basically no one there in the drone shot. And there's like, uh, what's the magic here? Yeah. So Photoshop exists. So that's great. Um, but for video, it doesn't yet. Well, they yeah. have Firefly, so maybe kind of, but, uh, no, usually it's sunrise. Um, so sometimes you'll have to work around like the pool cleaner. Cause that's usually when they clean the pool. But if you can get there within like maybe an hour of sunrise, not like just when it's rising, but mm-hmm. you know, when, when the sun's up a little bit, so the, the water's blue and stuff, um, that's usually the ideal time. Anytime after like eight thirty nine. You're getting all the people with the pool towels and the kids yeah. and the floats and all that stuff. Um, so there's that. Occasionally, uh, depending on the shoot, depending on the budget, they'll they'll shut down areas of the resort. Um, so yeah, it just depends on the shoot for that. But I usually always try to get the majority of the hero shots um, within that first hour after sunrise. Awesome. And just for maybe a quick sound bite, it's just a quick question, but. Um, What's the number one most important thing when you reach out to a company? Uh, I think it's what we talked about with creating intrigue and reducing the friction. If a client can see that you actually care about them, that you are in their psyche and you understand what makes their business better, as opposed to just saying, hey, I want to do this for your brand. This is how much it costs, all that kind of stuff. But when you actually show genuine care, then they're interested because you're interested in them. And when you reduce the amount of friction involved in engaging with you by just saying, hey, if you're interested, say yes, then they don't have to write a paragraph to you. They don't have to think of how they can apply what you said or what kind of budget they can allocate or anything like that. It's just say yes. Great. Let's move on. Now you're committed at least a little bit. Now we can talk the real stuff. Um, So I think that's probably the number one tip in terms of getting someone to respond. That's awesome. In a nice, concise form. Excellent. You're welcome, Taryn. Excellent. There you go. All right, gents. Until next time, it's been hey, a pleasure talking to both you. of you. Awesome. Thanks, guys.